I invite you to stand for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in this day, in this place, to worship before you. In a week where we have been harassed by the terrors of physical fire and wind, we come asking for the gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit and the fire from on high, that you would renew our hearts and minds and spirits with your presence. Bless us as we worship is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sing together hymn number 116.
Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, Welcome to our church. Uh, We're so glad that you came to worship with us this morning. We're really glad you're here. I hope you're as excited as I am for the Christmas season. A special thank you to everyone who made these decorations possible. It looks really lovely in here, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Well, as part of our uh, Christmas experience, uh, we have our annual Christmas concert, and in just a minute, I'm going to invite our choir director to share a few words about that. Uh, But we also have another special announcement, which is our own uh, Pastor Peter uh, brought a child into the world this week, him and his wife. Uh, So congratulations to uh, newborn Jasmine. Uh, Yes, so... Well, before our special announcement, we have uh, some business to take care of. We have some transfers out, including, as I see, uh, our own uh, Pastor Mike and his wife, Jean. So uh, is there a motion to accept these transfers? And a second? All those in favor reluctantly say amen. All right, the motion is carried. Thank you. And uh, John, go ahead and come forward and and tell us a bit about our, our concert next week. Good morning, church family. In this season of busyness, where the world just kind of crashes in on our brains and um, kind of unsettles us even a bit, we have a wonderful opportunity on Saturday to invite people to come and feel and experience the peace of God. And I hope that you all come and attend. It will be a very memorable evening. We will be passing the candlelight, Christ's light, amongst the congregation and end in singing of Silent Night. It will be a memorable experience, a wonderful way to invite others to the church to experience the joy and love that we feel every week here and every day. So I hope to see you there. I hope that you invite lots of people and that we have a wonderful evening where the children, the bells, the choir, the organ, our brass ensemble, and our string ensemble will all play to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, John, and we do look forward to that. Uh, Now is the time for our children's story. Uh, So children, please feel free to come forward at this time for uh, a story, and and the rest of us uh, at this time, please uh, greet your neighbor. Say, Say good morning and happy Sabbath to someone new. Come on down, children. This is your special moment. All the kids up front, I have a very special story to tell you. Are you a kid? (laughs) Good morning. Doesn't our church look beautiful? It looks great, doesn't it? Smell. What do you smell? You smell pine. Do you smell that? Yes. All the all the plants decorating our church. Why do we decorate our church at this time of the year? Yes. Why? Because we want it to be beautiful. Beautiful. Very nice. You had your hand. Because it's starting to be Christmas. That's right. It's Christmas time. How far before Christmas? How far before Christmas? Three weeks. That's pretty close. A little less than that. A little less than that. Yeah, maybe right around there. Well, today is the ninth, and Christmas is on the. Very good. Yes, some of you are some of you are counting down the days. Now, what's the most exciting thing about Christmas? Yes, tell me. Tell me. What is it? Presents? Presents, of course. Of course. Who likes presents? Yes. 
Everyone here loves presents. Yes, we all love presents. Now, what do you want for Christmas? Yes. Wings. Nice. Anybody else want to share? What do you want? Yes. A video game. A what? A video game. A video game. How about you? Legos. Legos. Those are cool. Beyblades. Nice. How about you? Um, a kitten. A what? Kitten. A kitten. <gasps> does mom and dad know dad does? does? Oh, well, yeah. Well, let's see. W how about you? An American girl. Nice. A unicorn. A unicorn. Ha! Huh. I want a unicorn if there's one out there. How about you? A VR simulator. That is so cool. You, you, shared, you shared yours, but share again. An Elsa dress. A dress. Well, we all want something, and I know that many of you uh, want something special. You can tell me what you want later, okay? Um, we all want something special for Christmas. And I want to share something with you. And I, I, I'm hoping that I can give this to someone today. Look what I have here. Ha ha! I have two identical presents. And I, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm hoping that I can give this to someone today. Um, if not you, maybe I can give this to someone. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Oops. Oops. Well, um, I still have two presents. I still have two presents here. Um, all right. Sorry about that. All right. So maybe I have one and a half present. All right. So I'm, I want to give this present to someone. Um, which one do you guys want? Yes. Tell me which one. You want the broken one? You want this one? Okay, hold on. In, in a show of hands, who wants the broken one? Oh, it fell again. Ah, uh, okay. And, okay, you can lower your hands. Who wants the, uh, this one, the nice one? Yes? We're pretty balanced there? Maybe? No? Ah, uh, but are you sure you want the broken one? How about this one? This one looks nice. Yes? Okay. Well, let's see what's, I'm, I'm going to leave the broken one on the side, okay? Let's see if I, if I were to give you this present. It's too many, too many hands. I can't, I only have one present. So let's just see what's inside, okay? Let's see. This is the, this was the nice one. What's inside? Nothing inside of the nice one. Oh, no. I think I might have dropped something that was in here. Are you sure you want this? You would want this one that was broken? Okay. Let's see if I were to give you this one, what's inside. What's that? <gasps> It's not a dollar. It's a $100 bill. Whoa. So the broken one had a $100 bill inside. And the other one that was really nice had nothing inside. Well, you know what I wanted to show you about these presents? Is this. That sometimes, sometimes we can look something on the outside and have nothing inside. And sometimes... We could be all broken, and we could have something better inside of us. Now, sometimes you don't have the talent to sing at church. Sometimes you don't have a nice dress to go to, to go to church. Or you don't have those cool shoes that lights to go to school. Or you don't have a cool backpack. Or you don't have the best friends or the friends you want to have in school, right? Sometimes uh, mom and dad cannot buy a Christmas tree, so you may not have a Christmas tree at home. And you feel like sad because of that, right? And you see, you look at other kids that they have uh, the Christmas tree. They have all the nice, the nice uh, gifts and they have the nice dress and nice shoes. But you know what? What really counts is what you are inside, not on the outside. You know what? We have Jesus in our hearts. And once we have Jesus in our hearts, Jesus makes it all things beautiful. And everything is okay. 
You know what? Because the value that you have inside of you counts more than what you have on the outside. Do you remember that? Thank you so much, kids. Between ages of 4 and 12, you can go to Children's Church, and I will see you next Sabbath. Will the deacons come forward for the collection of the morning offering? It is interesting that next quarter's lesson is on stewardship, so please get your quarterlies when they are available. Today's offering is for Adventist Community Service. And we have an Adventist Community Service across the street. It does many things for the community. It provides some jobs for individuals who will in need of jobs. It also provides food several days a week for people who are needy. So please, if you are interested in supporting Adventist Community Service, please mark it on your envelope. The loose offering is for church budget. Father God, we bring to you this gift, not of our necessity, but the fact that we love you and we are returning to you a portion of our earnings. 
Bless the gift that we have given, and may it continue to spread the gospel. We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Good morning, church. I hope you're having a wonderful Sabbath. And I think I heard some angels singing. <laughs> they sounded great. When you're sitting up here, you can hear them from the back. <laughs> uh, this is the time in our worship service where I'd like to ask anyone who has any special requests, praises, or thanks to come forward as we sing our prayer song. Now let those who are able kneel as we come to the Lord in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church and thank you for all the people that are here today. We pray that you bless us, that you bless us in such a way that we show your image to others and that we represent this church out in the community as you would have us to do, dear Lord. Thank you so much for all that you have given us. I want you to please be especially with those who are affected by the fire and any of those up front that have special requests, dear Lord. I pray that you especially be with them. And uh, just uh, thank you again for all that you do for us. And I pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was, a faithful, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this was, took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. This is the time of year when we as Christians celebrate what we call the Advent season. The word Advent is derived from a Latin word called Adventus, which means coming. And in the Greek, it is called Parousia. And as Christians, we use this term either to apply it to the first coming when Jesus was born or to the second coming when we look forward to him, having him return in glory at the end of time. Usually, our focus at this time of year is upon the celebrations of the first coming of Jesus when he embraced humanity by taking on human form. But that is only the beginning of the story. The child grew, matured into adulthood, 
lived a perfect life, died an undeserving death on our behalf, and then he overcame our greatest enemy, death, when he was resurrected from the grave. But we also have the promise that he would send us the Holy Spirit to be with us. And finally, that great hope when Jesus will return and deliver us from the ravages of living on this earth. The Advent symbolizes the presentation, or excuse me, the present situation where the church is living in the last days. And as God's people, we are especially looking forward to his return. At the same time, when Jesus came the first time, the people were looking for a Messiah, a Messiah to come to deliver them from the power, the powers that had them under their control. It also pointed back to a time when God delivered them from Egypt through the Exodus. Today, we can look back at the first coming and be reminded that Jesus will come again. And because of that, we can rejoice in the great promise that he has for us because Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. And we sing that wonderful Advent hymn called, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, because it perfectly represents the church's call for Jesus to come into our hearts during the Advent season. Just think of those precious words. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Well, Israel could have sung the song in expect, expectations of Christ's first coming. The church now sings the song in commemoration of his first coming, but in expectation of his second coming. God in his foreknowledge revealed to his, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 7:14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she, he, she will call his name Emmanuel. And then in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, as I read earlier, For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And it goes on to describe his government, this world has yet to experience that government. That government will occur when he returns and takes full control of the earth. But in the meantime, there is one place that Jesus can reign as king, and that's in the hearts and minds of his people. Emmanuel, God with us, is Jesus' promise to you to be in your heart and mind every day. Jesus, it says in the promise of Isaiah, was full of zeal, and he will reign in our hearts and minds now that when he returns, we will rejoice with him as he takes control of the whole world. In our scripture this morning, in Matthew 1, we were told that Mary would bring forth a son, his name was to be Jesus. You remember what the name Jesus means? Savior. For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Savior, will come to each one of us. 
And the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. This morning, I want to invite each one of you to practice and experience the presence of God with us in your own heart and in your own mind. It is more than Jesus taking on a human form because Emmanuel is the very spiritual presence of God offered to each one of us. In Acts 17, verse 28, it says, In him we live and move and have our being. That's what Jesus wants to give each one of us, his life, in order that we could live in him. And when he left to go back to heaven, the very last thing that he said to his disciples before he left in Matthew 28, 20 recorded, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So God with us was not just Jesus entering a human body. It was Jesus coming to this earth, conquering sin, and then he offered through the Holy Spirit his life to each one of us. We'll see in a few moments the texts that point this out, that Jesus is sharing his life with us. And note at the very end of that text is the word amen. Amen means so be it. So not only did he promise that he would always be with us, he declared so be it. See, sometimes in our lives we feel alone. We feel that God has left us because we can't see him. Or we don't sense his presence. But God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always. There's a story told of the legend of the Cherokee Indians as they took their young men through the rite of passage. I think it gives us a good little illustration of what I'm talking about. The father, the, the Cherokee father, would take his son out into the forest and blindfold him and he'd leave him out there all alone. He was to sit on a stump, blindfolded, and, and wait through a whole night long. And he couldn't move from that stump the whole night. It was after this, if he survived that night, he was declared by the tribe that he was a man. And he was not to tell the other boys of his experience because each one had to experience his own reality and the, his own walk into manhood. The boy was literally terrified because there he is out in the middle of nowhere, sitting on a stump, all alone. Wild beasts, beasts were around him, the noises of the night, the wind blowing. Who knew what animals might be out there or what human might come to bother him? But all night long, he sat stoically, never removing the blindfold. It would be the only way he could become a man. Finally, after that horrific night, the sun appeared and he removed his blindfold. It was then, and only then, that he discovered that his father had been sitting next to him the whole night long. That's the way it is with us, folks. We may have moments in our lives, moments like some may have experienced this year, this week rather, where the fires are, of, are around us, the winds are howling and dangers. There are many kinds in this world. But Jesus promises that he will always be there for us. You know, the Bible has some other ways of telling us the very same lesson. And it, we find one of these in, when Jesus came to meet John the Baptist early in his ministry. And you remember that John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for the Lord. And when Jesus walked up and John saw him, and John preached, and he said, After me comes the one more powerful than I, 
the straps and whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes big messages come in very little words. There's something very important about that simple little statement, being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Jesus promised to do. What does baptism mean? The word means immersion, being buried completely. John immersed in water. We understand that and we practice that. But Jesus' promise is that he will immerse us in the Holy Spirit. You know, immersion, sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as being sprinkled out upon us, you know? Former rain, latter rain, we talk about the sprinkling of the Holy Spirit beginning to be poured out. Jesus wants to immerse us in the Holy Spirit. It's more than just pouring out the gifts of the Spirit. It is also the very fruitage of the Spirit. Because we see in the very sanctuary message itself that Jesus is wanting to build his life and character in us. And that happens as we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. Last week, Pastor Morris filled our hearts with a good reminder that Jesus will come again soon. He cited the parable of the ten virgins. And that in that parable, there were ten looking and preparing for Jesus' coming. Five of them had extra oil. Five of them didn't. We call them the five wise and the five foolish virgins. But the, ba the difference between the two was the lack of oil. And oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. God has called us to have in our experience that personal, intimate baptism of his presence in our lives as he has given us the Holy Spirit. No, and the sad thing about it is those that did not have the Holy Spirit, they came to the door of the marriage supper of the Lamb wanting to get in, but what did Jesus say? I never knew you. You see, an intimate relationship through the Spirit is how God communion, communes with us and gives us the very presence of Jesus. Jesus was having the Holy Spirit be his representative on this earth. It is a reminder that we will every day be close to him. So whether we understand our relationship with, the, with Jesus in the context of Emmanuel, which means God's with us, or whether it is being baptized by the Spirit, or any number of other metaphors in the Bible, they're all saying the same thing. Whether it's Jesus as the vine and we the branches, whether he is the good shepherd and we the sheep, it's all being in relationship with Jesus. It's bringing God's life to us. God wants us to call on him and invite him in through the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 said, Now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. Jesus, working through the Holy Spirit, wants to change us from the inside out. I want to remind you of Jesus' farewell promise in John chapter 7. 
He said, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do go away, the helper will come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' life being given to us. And in John 14, verses 16 to 18, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you. And will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What a promise. Jesus wants to come into your very heart and very mind with the presence of the Holy Spirit and God himself. The Holy Spirit takes Jesus' place. The Holy Spirit brings Jesus' presence. And the Holy Spirit brings the truth about God to you. So let's ask ourselves this question. How can we grow to be happy and strong Christians? Or how can the Holy Spirit fill our lives? If it's so important, how does it happen? Well, Jesus made a very simple statement in John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you. That means live. Live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, letting his power work in you. The Tsar of Ages, page 676, again expands on this. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his Holy Spirit, a life of unreserved surrender to his service. You want the life of Christ? Invite the Holy Spirit in. Surrender to his leading. You see, there's, there is the receiving of the Spirit and the surrender to him. It's a two-part of the divine solution to change us. We must receive the gift that he offers. We must surrender to his leading. It's one thing to invite him in, it's another thing to follow him, to do what he leads us to do. And Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that your joy, may, that, my, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. God wants the best for us. Jesus knew the best gift that he could give us <coughs> was the Holy Spirit. We talk about Christmas gifts. Jesus wants to make Christmas every day for us by giving his spirit that we can be connected with him, that he is with us through his spirit. Well, why, why should a person ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit every day? Well, it's because that is where our life comes. Who amongst us would say, I'm going to give up breathing today? Or maybe I don't need to drink water or eat. There are some things that God designed to work. And he designed us to be in connection with him. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us life. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, The inward man or person, is being renewed day by day. This is why the Bible calls it walking with God. You know, God was, has always wanted to walk with these people. He's always wanted to be in the presence of them. Remember in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned? It wasn't God that ran away. He came to walk with them, even after they sinned. And Jesus came to this earth to walk with us even though we were sinners. That's the way God is. His love is unconditional. His desire is to be with us. 
and he wants to give us renewed life every day. In Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in life, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So daily, we can invite him in. We can ask for his presence. We can ask for his power. Christianity is not a do-it-yourself religion. It is not a religion of self-improvement. We believe in the supernatural. And that supernatural power is God's spirit at work in us. And we receive it by faith and we respond. Steps to Christ gives us some very practical advice on how to experience and know the Spirit on a daily basis. On page 70, I read, Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me. Let all my work be wrought in you. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you will be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. There's another text that goes along with this in the Bible and found in Ephesians 5.18. It says, be filled with the Spirit. The tense of this is an imperative. God's saying this is a must. A better maybe way of uh, translating it might be, let yourselves be consistently and continually filled anew with the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit means to be completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to be completely filled by Him. It isn't a one-time experience. It's rather it's something that has to be continually repeated. And Paul illustrates this in this text by the word, be filled. Being filled is, with the Holy Spirit means being filled with the life of Jesus. When the Spirit becomes a base of our operation, life takes on a different focus. We are living for Him. We are submitting to Him. Paul says, we are under our obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if the Spirit, but by the Spirit, you are putting death to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. Jesus came to save us, to give us life. And the Spirit is the mechanism that He, the, the person, and the presence, and the power of God in our lives every day. then how are we going to get this? Number one, you've got to ask for it. You've got to invite him in. Because God doesn't come in and beat down the door. He's waiting at the door for an invitation, the door of our lives. We must ask. We're told to ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. And sometimes... We say, but I prayed. But sometimes we pray for things that are not part of God's plan. And the Bible tells us you have not because you ask amiss, meaning according to the carnal mind, that you might spend it on your pleasures, as James mentions in 
chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. But God has called us to give our lives completely, to give in, to let go of ourselves. Desire of Ages, page 672, describes what happens sometimes. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefit. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agency. If we want Jesus in our lives, we must be willing to let him be king. That's what God called him to be. Not only the king of this world, but the king of the universe, but most of all, king of our lives. The one who is reigning, the one who is ruling, but he does it with such gentleness and with such love. The greatest need of our church today is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it tells us that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, the natural man is one who has no relationship with the Holy Spirit. He lived in a in the world, he doesn't inquire about God at all or rarely inquires about God. That's the natural man. But the spiritual person, it's different. And what makes us spiritual is not that we do a lot of good deeds. It's not that we do the right things. It is that we have the presence, the person, and the power of Jesus in us. God's presence is what makes us spiritual. And that's what God has called us, to make Jesus the very center of our lives. The spiritual person commits himself essentially and completely to Jesus, that he can come in and reign. But there is a third person mentioned in the scriptures. It's called the carnal man. Now, most of us, if, you, if I were to ask you to define what a carnal man is, you would, you would say, well, someone who's really out rip-roaring, doing sin big time. And you could fill in the blank with all kinds of different activities. But that's not what the, the Bible defines as a carnal man. The Bible calls the carnal man the one who's attempting to do good without the Holy Spirit and the life of Christ inside. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 4. And I, brethren, would not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even, even now you are not able to for you are still carnal. Hmm. Believers being called carnal. For where there was envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? There it is. Not being controlled by the Spirit of God. Arguing and being envious, divisions. Mere men, that's the natural human without Christ. One says, I am Paul, the other I am Apollos. Are you not carnal? That's what the scripture says. There's only one thing that makes us a Christian. It's not the name of the church we belong to. It's not our decoration of what philosophy we follow. It's being connected to the living God, Jesus Christ. That's what makes us a Christian. Having his holy presence in us, that's what makes us spiritual. That's what makes us him, his. So being carnal then means the person lives from the power of the flesh that is normal human strength and abilities. 
it means that we're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. It means we're not trusting God. We haven't invited him in. We aren't living with Jesus. Romans 8 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Well, friends, that boils down to a personal choice. The main difference between being spiritual and carnal in the church has everything to do with having Jesus in our hearts and in our minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual Christianity, or Christians are those who are filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus invites every one of us to accept that gift. It is his greatest gift to us during this time between his first coming, his second coming, where he promises to be with us, Emmanuel, God not only with us, but in us, filling us with his life, his power, his strength, his motivations, his thoughts, everything that we could possibly want. Jesus loves us even more than we love ourselves. So this morning, during this time of the Christmas season, when we focus on Jesus who came to save us, what a time to embrace Emmanuel. Jesus walking and talking with us every day, living in our hearts. Surely only he can make us, have, only his presence can give us the strength to have the peace that passes all understanding because he is the prince of peace. He is the joy of our salvation. He is the love for God and fellow man that we cannot self-generate. Only God can make that happen, and it's offered as a gift. We simply must believe that it is ours. He doesn't say try hard to make good things happen. He said believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And this is what he's giving us. Emmanuel, God with us. May God bless you as you seek to experience the fullness of his presence every day, particularly as we are reminded of it in this Christmas season.
receive the blessing of the Lord. May Emmanuel be with you and in you and work through you to be a light to the world, to represent the peace that passes all understanding, the joy of his presence, and the love that brings others the hope of eternal life in Christ. Bless you as you go your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.